May 1985, almost 37 years ago, the Grey organisation left the French house in Soho just before closing time. A little inebriated and with adrenaline pumping, they headed over to Mayfair, hidden in the back of a white transit van, armed with buckets of red paint. Following flashlight signals from their lookout positioned on Clifford Street, they entered Court Street, the home of London's leading contemporary art dealers from Burlington Gardens. To quote Mr. Toby Mott, there's no going back. We are not like the other tossers talking about this and that. We're going to do it. What happened next is the subject of this exhibition and the reason we're here this evening. So on behalf of the Mayor Gallery, uh, I want to welcome you this evening and to the conversation that Toby is going to have with Peter, structural hierarchy in British culture. My name is William Lane. I curated the show. And uh, after, after Peter and Toby have spoken, there will be an opportunity for questions. Toby, if you don't know, uh, was Grey Organisation's principal protagonist. He's a collector, designer, publisher, entrepreneur, artist, and keeper of the Grey Organisation archive. Peter York is a journalist, broadcaster, and consultant. His fine tuned antennae numbers him amongst one of the country's most erudite and perceptive social commentators. He has a record of recognising and identifying trends well before anybody else. Amongst other books, he's the author of Authenticity is a Con, <laughs> Peter York's 80s, and he's the co-author of the official slave major Hamlet. Toby and Peter, for yours. Thank you, William. Thank you. Well, um, <laughs> good evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Yes. Uh, lovely to see you all looking so, so fresh and familiar. Now, on that fateful night, and it, and it was recognised just, just about midnight, people got aware of that, there were these very young men in their very early 20s throwing grey paint, which they'd thought about very carefully. It, notwithstanding the fact that they come from the French pub, which sort of slightly, you know, is a difficult uh, factor here. You wouldn't expect it to happen from the French pub, but nonetheless, they got emulsion, which they had thoughtfully watered down for maximum incap, because if you threw it just like that, you, it'd go about two foot. So they watered it down and put them in, it in sort of Tesco tins. So they had thought the whole thing out technically, which it is the, the, the Achilles heel of many art uh, collectives making manifestos. Um, and they made a stir, and when they were apprehended, and that happened very quickly too, for very mysterious and fascinating reasons, they were banned from central London. They were so important that they were banned from central London, possibly for reasons of state security, and they had to go to America to earn their living. I mean, <laughs> doing very, very various and, and fascinating things. And young Master Mott here is one of the members of that grey suited, collarless shirted, <laughs> tieless, number two buzz cut hair group, what I call the Polish lab technician look. And what you have to have with that is very, very thin wire specs. You can't have these sort of specs. Um, and so showing here, as auction porters used to say, showing here, Mr. Mott, uh, sporting what might be called the investment bank partner look, the genial <laughs> investment bank partner look, very much collared and tied now. Toby, who were the Grey Organisation and why were they? Why did they want? Why did they want to attack the respectable traders of Court Street who were only making their living? Um, okay, I'll give you. A what little, was their excuse? A little backstory. So yeah. we grew up in Central London. Yeah. Three of us attended Pimlico Comprehensive. We ended up there from other schools, um, and one of us was from uh, Manchester. 
And prior to the Grey organization, we had something called the Anarchist Street Army, which came, we were punks, obviously, and we were kind of inspired by Crass <coughs> at that stage. And then as we matured, the Grey organization came into being, and at the time, we funded ourselves by throwing illegal nightclubs in warehouse, warehouses, empty warehouses throughout London. And we were making art, and we were making Super 8 videos, video, and paintings. <clears throat> and at the time, it's a bit difficult now to see it, but it seemed that the art world was very much part of the British establishment and close to us. And this street was the art establishment. There was no East London, there was no Shoreditch, there was very much Mayfair. There may have been things happening elsewhere, but this was like the Houses of Parliament, the representation of the kind of creative cultural London. And we felt excluded, and not just ourselves, but there are other collectives at the time. We lived in East London. Many of them were based in East London, from Throbbing Gristle, Psychic TV, uh, Neo Naturists, and others in Europe. So being a collective, we were kind of inspired by Gilbert and George. <coughs> we featured in their work, and they uh, patronized us to some extent. But nonetheless, the doors were closed, and we needed to say hello. And the idea was born to throw grey paint in the face of the establishment. That's a quote from Voltaire. Um, so we did, and we planned it meticulously. And there were several, there were the, the three core members, but we had many acolytes who helped with the planning. And we did leave the French house and we wore boiler suits over our grey suits. And uh, the van pulled up at this end, and it very slowly made its way down Cork Street with the back doors open and many tins of diluted grey paint stacked up so we could replenish ourselves and attack every single gallery on the street. We probably did it in 30, 45 seconds. We then piled in the van and went to Zanzibar. So it all sounds, <laughs> which doesn't exist, but that was a very sort of upmarket cocktail bar in Covent Garden. Kind of, uh, what would you, how would you just like uh, advertising, like 80s, like that. Very right? 80s, very <laughs> marketing speak land. <laughs> but it was one of the few places open and our friend Sophie Park in ran it. So we all ended up in there and we couldn't actually believe that we had accomplished it, this, an idea, and we brought it to life and we accomplished it. And then the rest of the story is the police and the consequences, and we can touch on that. So it was a cry, let us in. We've come all the way from the French pub, and we're going all the way to the Zanzibar, dangerous rebels that we were. Let us in, please. And instead, you got excluded from central London. And what's that mean? We were banned from central London. That was one of the stipulations of our bail. <coughs> it meant we could go to the East Village in New York, where we were represented by the Civilian Warfare Gallery, who took a sort of keener interest in this kind of uh, activity. I love this language. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and then we prospered in New York, so all Except was all right. Well. Um, and yeah, we ended up working and, and so making music videos in yeah. what was then the sort of beginning of hip hop culture. And, but to come back to London at the time, it definitely was not the London of today. It was very grey. You could probably only get a cappuccino at Bar Italia. Yeah. There was hardly anywhere to drink late, apart from some illegal shabeen type places. And the whole thing was really conservative and strict, even though you had things like the New Romantics and this kind of always this bubbling under the surface of this straight-laced society, this kind of bright, colourful kind of mm. actions, like, say, the New Romantics, and in our case, we parodied British Soviet culture. That was our kind of look. Yeah. And we didn't wear ties, because ties represented belonging to some kind of social group yeah. or class, which I've since joined, but at the time, they wouldn't let me in. Um, so we were very much Mavericks, outsiders, and we lived in Bow, East London, along with, and we actually had a house, it's unbelievable, 
for like uh, maybe 50 pounds a month, like a whole house, two houses. Um, and we had a huge warehouse on Borough High Street, and all this was without working, because that was obviously an anathema to have a job. But what you haven't mentioned <laughs> is absolutely core to all this, core to the idea of throwing a paint in the face of the establishment, all that stuff. Did you have a manifesto? Yes. We had 12 points. We, we pasted it on the walls of the street. Um, one of the points that I can remember is garlic is essential to good living. <laughs> so it was a sort of Elizabeth David manifesto. It was a sort of... Uh... We were very keen fans of Elizabeth yes. David. Um, yeah, we, um, we also dropped off on Fleet Street, where all the newspapers were at that time, a press release explaining yeah. why we did it, and also promoting our exhibition, the first painting exhibition, at 346 Old Street, yeah. which happened maybe the following month. Yep, so you were in all the right places. Mm. But what was it that attracted you in the first place to be what it's called, the anarchist street army. The anarchist street army. Was it punk? Was it Pimlico? Because there's clearly a Pimlico problem here. <laughs> I say this, I live in Pimlico, so I'm very alive. <laughs> alive. There's nothing like that in Pimlico now, let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen. It's, in terms of that sort of thing, it's dead as a doornail. On you go, Pimlico. Oh, well, Pimlico was the first purpose-built comprehensive school in the UK. Um, yeah. It was a brutalist building made of glass that was freezing cold in the winter and boiling hot in the summer. They've since torn it down, mm. even though it was listed. Um, and it was really a kind of factory or breeding ground for these uh, ideas of education, progressive education. Uh, of the time. It kind of failed. It was also the first school to have a murder, um, not by the Anarchist Street Army. <laughs> uh, anyway, we survived. We always would say, and all of us who graduated from there would say we survived Pimlico School, because it was a social experiment. Um, but that's where we were all thrown together. And then a lot of us went to Kingsway College, which was another notorious sort of education establishment where members of the Sex Pistols went before us. and So London always kind of <laughs> fermented these things, often in, well, from all, not necessarily yeah. central London, but that was our story. So there you were thinking, coming forward back to the, so to speak, the Grey organisation, mm. uh, it sort of sounds like an updated Salon de Refuse, but you're saying it's not like that at all. It's not like any previous uh, group. Yeah, it is. Um, like from the Vortices to Dada. We well, were inspired by that kind um, of thing. Uh, well, I read something that said where you w people would say this in a clever dick uh, uh, art history way, and you would say, no, it's nothing like that at all. No, it's think. not remotely like that at all. We are uniquely creatures of uh, the, the 1980s present, and we never, uh, we're, we're not like those no, we like cloaky, <laughs> flowing cloaky We like the constructivists people. and this idea of making art as a unit without yeah. this kind of hi heroic artist figure. Yeah. We liked all that stuff, Bauhaus. We yeah. liked all that. And um, at the time, remember, there was this monolithic state threatening this one, or the West. It was real. It's not like Putin today. It was real. We were under threat, and it was distinctly sort of grey and ominous, Soviet Russia. And we borrowed from that, and then I guess we borrowed the sort of flair of the West and sort of amalgamated it. So, but we weren't reinventing the vortices or something. We were, you know, I guess we were like Gilbert and George, but multiplied. Yeah, but the fact was, you knew all that stuff. Yeah, we were. We knew it. We you knew all that stuff. Savvy, you yeah. weren't a bit a, a, like, let's say, the creatures of Malcolm's, Malcolm McLaren's creatures, who he's claimed, they didn't know any of that stuff, and it was Malcolm had imposed it on them, and they'd never been near any educational establishment at all. No, there was no one pulling... Kingsway College. No one pulling our strings. Yeah. 
So there, there, you, there you were. You knew all this, this stuff, and you did a bit of it, but it was different. But we were very young. Yeah. What about the work? The artwork? The work. Behind what? you? Yes. So we well, documented uh, yeah. our, li our everyday lives. This was part of our art. Yeah. And our big paintings we drew around each other. So it was very much ourselves in the work, like our handprints, um, our detrius from drinking. Drinking was a big part of yes. it. Yes. There weren't, drugs weren't a part of it at all. That, yeah. Was, yeah. that was something much later. But yeah, so this, the artwork you can see is like the contents of our rubbish bin, a canvas put on the floor of the studio, marked over time. So, But then we yeah. were adopted by Lynn Franks, who is uh, a character that Absolutely Fabulous is based on. And she got us to work with the Labour Party, Swatch Watch, Brutus Jeans. So we... Uh, <laughs> It's a very 80s story, that, isn't it? <laughs> we were grateful to be co-opted into that. And yes. meanwhile, we'd done this notorious action here. Yeah. But it was all from a landline in Bow. Obviously, there was no computer, there but, was no cell phone. Yeah, where is all the work, apart from being here? In my archive. So you've got lots and lots and lots of it. In Belgravia. In Belgravia. <laughs> Just up the road from me. Yeah, just up the road from me. <laughs> I'm on the wrong side of the tracks. <laughs> um, and tell us more about the art, the actual product, the stuff that's in your archive. Well, there's a lot of... So that we may want to possess it. There's what we call ephemera, which is paper detrius, yeah. which I saved everything. And it, it's moved over the years into different garages, and now it's all been... Mm -hmm archived and photographed. So there's all the paper stuff, and that's correspondence from, you can see over there in the cases from the police and our lawyers who represented us to fight the case. Um, and luckily, things like sketches for the De La Soul album cover, which is considered one of the top 10 mm. album covers ever designed. Mm. And so luckily, I did keep all this stuff. Some stuff rotted away, like big paintings, but we have some of those. Mm. Um, and then a lot of this work, when you look at it now, or when I look at it, it is of a moment. You could make it today, but somehow, to me, it represents three, four decades ago. It seems old, in was a good it, way. Was there anyone you thought of as your, anyone, any group that you thought of as your peers? Yeah, they are, we can't They've cottoned on to the same whatever it is as we have. They're not like us, but then again, they are like us, and we respect them, and, and, and. There was a group of artists based around a band called Leibark in Eastern Europe called New Neus Lovens Kunst. We like them. We like General Idea in Canada. We like Joseph Boyce. Um, yeah. There was other stuff going on. Mm. People would write us letters. Our address was, there's like mail art. We were recipients of mail art. Uh, there was a guy in Australia called the Art Army. We would correspond with all these different people around the world who found us, because we were featured in things like the NME, which would mm. be a platform for this yeah, kind yeah. of outsider stuff. Not necessarily art press, mm. like music press, which... I guess, was more open to new stuff going on. So, yeah, and I saved all that correspondence, so I got letters, hundreds of letters, because this is even before fax. But what happened after you were forced out of central London by the security services? So it sounds the security services were very keen for these, uh, these boys to be out of central London. They represented it a threat to something. Yeah, we need to add that MI5 was based on this street. We didn't know that. When we did the action, we were very quickly arrested by very senior policemen. And we didn't understand why, um, you know, police at the top of the police. And then one of them said, you've upset some very high-ranking people. And I'll just tell you that we went to court and when you enter the system here, you have many hearings at Well Street Magistrate Court, just by uh, Oxford Circus. And then on the third hearing, 
There was no case listed, even though we had paperwork with a case number, and there was no case and no case had ever existed. And our barrister said to us, you know, this is unheard of, this has never happened. We had really great representation by a firm called Offenbachs, who represented the kind of notable bank robbers of the day, like, um, who was the guy, the big free campaign where they dug up the cricket pitch and Davis. George Davis. George, George Davis. Davis. They represented. Free George Davis. Yeah, yes. they represented yep. the higher echelons yes. of, um, of criminal Britain. Anyway, <laughs> they said this has never happened. Your case has evaporated. I don't know. We, we don't. Under anyway, we left and that was that. And all the bail restrictions. So, how there. soon were you out of here, out of you, the four of you? How soon were you in America? Well, that's. Well, we were invited to exhibit with civilian yeah. warfare, and we went there, and then we were there, and it was great and everything, and yeah. then we decided to go back, and um, things were more fluid then, yeah. you know, like that, even having a green card wasn't an issue, and, but, and then we just relocated. But did you all relocate? Yeah. Did you Did you go on doing it? Yeah. Together? Yeah, to, to In 19, the same place? To 1991, yeah. So why did you stop then? We just ran its course like a band. Yes. We all hated each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's quite a, quite a while to be doing something quite as fluid as that, isn't it? Yeah, it's great that we did last that long because we created a lot of work and it's kind of substantial. Someone's, I don't know how long the Beatles lasted. I think we're almost. Not long. No. no, not long. As, not, not long big. Right. Long time oh, getting, yeah. not long big. Right. What so yeah, it? so we were a real thing, you know, mm. not just an idea. What would you like now? Now you talk about the court records being vanished. Mm. Apart from you, nobody else seems to be documenting the Grey organisation until now, of course. There's been a until little now. Bit. There's, been, there's a been a little bit. bit, but you know, it wasn't from the rooftops. What would you like the Grey organisation to be remembered for now? What's What's its finest gift to the world? Well, that kind of um, the initi initiative to do something, yep. despite you know whatever situation you, you see yourself in. It's odd because I often sound like a Thatcherite, which I'm not. But that kind of the impetus to get up and do something—it's kind of Thatcherite <laughs> ideology. But I'm coming from a different place, but saying with the same message. <laughs> Yes, one, two, three, go. Yeah. Yes. And now, now you're out of it. Do you feel tender about it, or been there, done that? No, I feel. I definitely feel it's behind me. Yes. And I like. I feel it's rewarding when I look at it in this kind of situation. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of elevated. Yeah. Anything more you can tell us about the wonderful things around the wall? Well, I think William Lynn, who's the curator, has chosen aspects of the Grey organisation for, from, from all its kind of activities and place. So we've got the London stuff and we've got some New York stuff, and of course we've got the action itself, the Cork Street attack. And we kind of covered the, the period, 84 to 91, and there's a lot of material to choose from. But yeah, I think we've done a concise exhibit of what the Grey organisation were about. Why was it called that? Because we, we didn't want to be black or white. We wanted to be this neutral space. Because it, it was just at the time you said London was grim and you couldn't get a drink yeah. late and all that, that. But in fact, what was happening when you were going and first going and doing this and so on, was that London was getting terribly colourful. I lived... Starting to get colourful. At the beginning of the Grey Organisation, I lived in what's called the Carburton Street Squats. Yeah. With Boy George, yeah. Marilyn, Animal Nightlife, basically what's called New Romantics. And I would go to Blitz. So I was part of all that, but I was wearing a grey suit, cropped hair and a white shirt. So I wasn't attracted. That wasn't my... I wasn't a seditionary's wearing punk. Mm -hmm. I was a DIY punk, which um, 
So I didn't purchase mm. Vivian Westwood clothing and I wasn't in the fashion end of punk. I was in the DIY where we made our own stuff and we took anarchism seriously. So I wasn't attracted to blitz culture, which was the David Bowie, um, that side of punk, yep. the kind of glam rock side. I was the crass side and the clash and Adam and the Ants, which prior to their pop mm. incarnation were very dark. Mm. Kind of S and M, black and white. Mm. So, so my the dress code and why it's called the Grey Organization came out of that side mm. of punk, which is a bit more like American punk, black and white. And, yeah. yeah, in counter distinction to all those colourful, flossy things. Yeah. But I was living amongst the other side of it. Yes. Yeah. No. Well, I would go to Blitz, dressed roughly as I am now, or as you are now. <laughs> it, it was all. We're in it was all. It was all right. <laughs> Nobody, uh, nobody, you. nobody attacked you. <laughs> if um, you could get past Steve Strange, of course you could. Yeah. Oh. We could. We could. Yeah. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, you'll be longing to ask Toby searching questions. Or Peter. And Mr. Ling <coughs> is going to handle you, so to speak. Okay. Right. So, any questions? Deal. Question. Do you think you've sold out? Yeah. <laughs> no, I crossed the uh, Great Divide, and also, I celebrated my 58th birthday yesterday, and I think it's more fitting to be this side of the glass than out on the street protesting, and that should be left. Do you think, do you think throwing the paint was um, an attempt to be noticed by Court Street or to be included in the There's to be noticed by everyone. How would you feel if I threw great pain for the opening of this exhibition? Where? On the front. Well, it, it wouldn't mean anything. <laughs> You'd have to do something else. Or something similar. Or something similar. Probably <laughs> some, uh, okay. uh, something. Uh, something similar. No, something it doesn't have to be paid. <laughs> but something How like... How would you feel if I did that? I wouldn't... I, don't, I wouldn't think... I would just think you need a new idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'll open the text. <laughs> you can buy the paint. <laughs> uh, the Mayor Gallery is selling a limited edition pots of Cork Street Grey. It's colour matched to the paint we threw on the glass windows. And you can do it at home. <laughs> but don't, because they're collector's items. <laughs> Toby, how did the reconciliation come about with the Mayor Gallery? And what was it like when you first thought and who approached you and, and how did that all go down? Well, me and James had a big fight. <laughs> um, William um, was the peacemaker. We had to settle the cleaning bill 37 years later with interest. No, we didn't. <laughs> um, James was very open to it. And uh, it just goes, I don't know, somehow time heals, I guess. But William was instrumental in putting the show together. And how soon did you get caught after you guys went to the Zanzibar? Within the next day, the following morning at like 6 a.m. Oh, after the day after. Spooky, isn't it? Yeah. How did they know it was you, actually? Well, we did paste our stuff up, Grey Organisation, but <laughs> <laughs> it's not like the internet. Like, it's not like Grey Organisation had a registered address or anything. Like, I don't know how they knew you 13... <laughs> How did they know 13 Bruce Road E3 was where the Grey Organisation <laughs> would be sitting there with their cans of lager or cups of tea? Um, I don't know how they quickly got to us. Well, ob obviously, you warranted special attention simply as a function of the geography, didn't you? you might, if you had PC Plod, you might, might have got away with it for a whole week. <laughs> But yeah, you can see in the paperwork, there's endless statements from policemen. They took it really seriously. Um, but I think at some point they must have realized this just, it was doing us more good than them. Do you think you would have got more publicity if it had been in, in another street? No, no, this was the street. No, and, if it's in a street that didn't have the circus. Oh, yeah, who knows what would have happened. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, well, they certainly it would have just been a regular police thing as opposed to we were arrested by special branch. Toby, uh, apart from doing various other exhibitions you've done and work often relating to punk, uh, what are you doing going forward? Well, right now, I'm in the middle of a, a book about the last paper culture, pop culture, UK, and it's the history of rave flyers, and it's from uh, the Stonehenge Free Festival all the way through to Jungle, and the book ends at the year 2000, and because then it's the advent of PDFs and exchanging information online. So, yeah, I've amassed a collection of flyers, and it's going to be a substantial book, and it will be coming out in March, and it's called New Age Back to Back. And have you made enough money to live in Belgrade? <laughs> <laughs> Pop culture. Because <laughs> punk is very um, desirable. And it's, uh, I've helped elevate it prior to, to when I got involved, people would show Jamie Reed artwork in a pub or something. And I thought there's a trick here that the people who want this stuff are in their 40s, 50s, and a lot of them are wealthy because people who are involved in punk, going back to what I said before, have that kind of DIY spirit. And a lot of them work around here in hedge funds and stuff. And they don't want to purchase that stuff in a grotty atmosphere. So I did a exhibition at Hauncher Venison Gallery, which used to be the back galleries of the Royal Academy. And we, we elevated these posters and sold them for considerable money. And now I price myself out of a market I helped create. So I'll be doing that with Rave next. Yeah, no, I, I did a show with Jamie Reed like 30 years yeah. ago in the Hamilton's Gallery, it's which again was taking punk to posh. I sold one of those posters for big money in America. For the fuck. Yeah. Yeah. Nice post. Is it inevitable, um, you will say, uh, in effect, there is no other posture suitable for a more mature man than um, becoming a, a, a good, a decent bourgeois? Um, is there another path yet? Yet a different path? Well, working as I do with counterculture. Mm. Um, all across the world and hosting exhibitions, mm. I can tell you there's nothing worse than a man in his 50s, 60s coming towards you holding a can of lager to grab you and tell you how great the pistols were. Or well, usually, actually, it's another really third rate band like mm. GBH mm. and trying to put his arm around you. And, mm. Oh, there's nothing worse. <laughs> I think you have to mature. But what I'm saying is, forward. but do you have to mature into that? Is that the only possible no, way to grow up? No, because I, I, in my rave book, I interview a guy called Alan Lodge, who has lived in caravans and the peace convoy, and he's mm. in his 70s maybe, and he documented the Battle of the Beanfield, and he is a very admirable character because he still lives by those rules and that morality and kind of inspirational, actually, because but he never has lived in the inner city, but he mm. still has those ethics and um, sticks up for those communities. And so, no, of course not. But being a punk in your sixties is just awful. Well, it's all, almost inconceivable. I'm just saying. <laughs> There's many of them. Is there a grown-up? Is there a different way of growing up? You will know, ladies and gentlemen. Is there a different way of growing up? <laughs> if you start off as a lively young writer, wherever it might be, are you doomed to end up writing for the Daily Telegraph? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, are, are you? I mean, uh, as you uh, will remember, Julie Birchall. Mm -hmm. She is now writing for the Daily Telegraph. Yeah. Except when she uh, provokes libel cases, which is uncomfortable. Ask Neil Brown. He's a writer. I think that um, a, a good option is to do things subversively, very quietly, and, and without making oneself conspicuous. So, 
the answer to your question is that we, we, we won't know what Toby is doing. He may be doing something that he doesn't want to tell us. About. Something quite different? Yeah. <laughs> Are you doing something quite different? Time will tell. Something, uh, uh, something subversive. But there does seem, however, to be, uh, to be a sort of pattern which uh, you think there must be more to things than this. Is this you know, the, the doom of going from conspicuously rebellious to being conspicuously authoritarian, let's say? Uh, and it's an well, art. James Mayer's tie. <laughs> <laughs> Which is an inspiration to us all. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> or indeed your coat, Hemi. <laughs> yes. But I would hope that um, most creative people have still got a naughty child somewhere in there. Yes. Mm. I think it's very sad mm. that everybody just joins up. Mm. I think you've got to have some subversion in you. Mm. But also being in a position where I can take, say, punk and put it in an environment, a conservative environment, mm. like a, a mm. gallery or mm. rave culture and elevating mm. them. So maybe that's my role or this material. Mm. Um, and leave the kind of creation of whatever to, to whoever's coming up behind us. And do you watch those people? You see a lot of those people saying you go around the world and see um, lots of ephemera mm. produced by quote yeah, unquote go, rebel cultures. I participate in this culture called zine publishing, which comes from the punk kind yeah. of genesis. And it's very thriving globally, actually. And uh, yeah, it's inspiring. But then a lot of stuff is online, which isn't really my forte. Mm. But you're saying zine culture is still thriving. Oh, yeah. Self-publishing is huge. Literally paper. Because I can remember writing something about it in quite early in the 80s. Mm. The idea that you, may, you might go to bed, an ordinary person, and wake up the next day a magazine publisher, even if it was a very teeny-weeny one, you could, it would one, two, three, go, mm. like sniffing glue. Exactly. Yeah, that culture is thriving. Mm. Well, it's good to know that, mm. isn't it? I had no idea. <laughs> And are you doing any? I do books. Yeah. <laughs> but it's still it's still there. Should we? Um, but yeah, presume? yeah. There's the well, there's off print at the Tate. Yeah. That's an annual event. Yeah. There's in New York. There's printed matter art book yeah. fair, and they also yeah. have one in Los Angeles and Miami, and then in Paris. There's off print. Um, Berlin, they all misread in Berlin. It's global, yeah. It's, uh, and that's something which I participate in, and I'm part of that community of exchanging ideas. And I work in New York with Dashwood Books, who are a big champion of it, and yeah, art book publishing. I must say, I'm longing to see more of that output over the years, but you've got, to, you've got to, commercially, you've got to ration it a bit. Actually, a book I just, I've done two editions. One was called Dictator Banknotes, and then we just published Dictator yeah. Postage Stamps, yeah. and you published Dictator Homes. Dictator Homes, <laughs> and they are, they are fascinating, yeah. Dictator's Houses, because they look a very, very Marble Arch. <laughs> and, and, you know, they used to be at Marble Arch, around the corner from where I lived, actually, a, a shop called Salon Francaise. Um, all the gold. Uh, Salon Francaise, which went, uh, went uh, meant uh, the, the gold room, Louis the Hotel, as Nicky Haslam would say. <laughs> Louis the Hotel, uh, furniture slathered in bad gilding. And that's what, you know, blown up a thousand times all those dictators' houses had, with a few exceptions. Franco was a bit tasteful, <laughs> but um, most, mostly it looks like that. So, warming to this thing, it is, dictators are fascinating, yeah. aren't they? Every other clothes are fascinating, anything, all, all that stuff is very fascinating. Um, when Trump came in, um, somebody from Politico's in Washington rang, you know, how very, very polite and nice uh, some young American ladies can be and said, do you think by, it's even possible that there's any connection between your marvelously marvelous book 
and the interiors of our new president. <laughs> and I had to say, because I'd seen it, I'd seen the pictures of uh, 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 the, the penthouse above Trump Tower. You got it in one lady because you knew who Trump was going to be from looking yeah. at those pictures. And you sort of knew that this was the person who was going to do January 6th and never, never give up. And it was designed by somebody who used to design casinos. <laughs> That's why it, it had that look. So you've got, what are these dictator things so you've I've got? So I've done two books by, published by Cultural Traffic. One, it features actual banknotes with dictators on them, from Mao to Idi Amin, etc. Yep. And then last year was uh, stamps featuring dictators. And they're small editions, but the books are very expensive. But they are amazing. Well, I want, I, 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 I want, I want it. And your book is next to them on my bookcase, in the dictator oh, section. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> Every home should have one. So not only do we wear the same tie, yep. we publish books on the same subject. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that is quite spooky <laughs> and uh, very subversive, obviously, <laughs> obviously as, as well. More, please. Ladies and gentlemen, more. Um, this is a question for you, James. Um, how, what was your reaction when this happened? How did it make you feel? And what? Well, there he is. Know, there he is. I think this I, is I yes. said to someone, you know, any publicity is good publicity. So, you know, um, we were talking yesterday to Jane from Wellington, who was work, had just started working for Leslie there. And what was Leslie's reaction? He was rather amused. And one of you said, look, what about you, Jake? You had to wash it off. <laughs> I didn't wash it off. I didn't know who did. <laughs> <laughs> what about the artists who were being exhibited at the time, James? What did they think? Well, Shapinsky was that extraordinary case where um, Valdemar, whatever he's called. Yeah, that's right. Yes, wrote a scathing um, review. And Terry Galley and um, what's he called? Um, the, you know, who had the fact that I put on him. Oh, yes. Rushdie. Yep. Rushdie. Mm. Um, we're making a, I think actually they made a film on him because there was an extraordinary. Um, person called um, Akumal Ramachandran, who was a teacher from Bangalore, who decided and met Shapinsky's son and decided to promote him and first tried Anita Brock. <laughs> but, uh, and anyway, she just won the um, Booker Prize for whatever. Um, and it turned, we got the most incredible publicity and still the film, the, the Shapinsky film, and then somebody wrote an article, in, there was a big article in Lawrence Weschler, I think, written for the New Yorker. So, it, uh, but the film is still played on um, PV13 or whatever. And one time, um, I, you know, um, more than once a year, and one time I got a friend of mine said he was in the he was in the Carlisle with his wife and he was in the bathroom and suddenly he shouted out, What the fuck is James doing in our bedroom? And it was the spill. Toby, did you encounter any of the artists in your travels? No, we were unaware. We weren't those weren't the artists that we rubbed shoulders with. We rubbed shoulders with the the excluded at the French house and the coach and horses. <laughs> Doesn't sound terribly excluded, if I may say so. <laughs> well, you've got to remember, you didn't need to communicate. Uh, you just needed to be, it was very much about place. So you just, everyone, would, our group and the others would drink in the French house yeah. because they sold half lagers. Yeah. Um, and you didn't have the kind of football-type geezers. 
So it attracted the art community. Yeah. And the Coach and Horses was open on Saturday night, whereas the French was closed. And we were also members of the Colony Club. Um, and so you just needed to go there. You didn't yes. need to yeah. arrange yeah. and endlessly yeah. texting. And you, just, yes. you could just go there. And even if you arrived from another city or something, and you were that type, you would very quickly become part of the group. Mm. And the same, say, when we, w we would go to Berlin and uh, we would go to, like, Cafe Einstein or wherever mm. it was, and then we would be part of that group yeah. in Berlin without it may be one introduction or whatever. But well, uh, what about when you went to Rochdale? <laughs> <laughs> we went to Sheffield. Lisa Stansfield. <laughs> the same. There's always, you would find the like-minded and they would always be yeah. in an obscure pub. Um, yeah. Peter, were the great organization on your radar in 1985? Yes. Yeah. And I have to tell you, the reason they were was I thought, oh, that's a nice get up. <laughs> but you know, that's a nice get up. Oh, I like that. I mean, that's good. That, uh, you, uh, they're making, they're making, a, st they're making a nice uh, visual statement, and they've, uh, all the linkages are good. That, uh, you know, what I call the, uh, 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 earlier, the whole Polish lab technician thing, which was a, a, definitely a, a, an art strand, and it was, even though I may rather like the new romantics and the, pop, you know, the population of them, and they were fun to talk to, I could see that there was room for a, you know, Austere. Uh, something more austere, something continuing the great traditions of 1976 and 7 was, uh, was very good. They were nice, they're nice, a suit is nice. How, how closely were they in the tradition of English pop groups wearing their grey suits, the Beatles, early Rolling Stones? The, the, the Grey Organisation in some ways all seemed to me like a, a band without music. I can imagine a film with the monkeys Mm. Mm. Well, how, did you feel that? Yeah. We, we did were, you were a bit like a band? Yeah, like Joy Division. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we had more to do with music than yeah. with art at yeah. the time. The art at the time we liked was like art and language, because they seemed to be a machine, and Gilbert and George. The rest of it, like, say, it's obscure, like Bruce McLean, or the art that was happening, Tony Craig, whatever, we didn't connect with that. So we connected more with how bands were presenting yeah, yeah. themselves, especially mm. bands from Manchester. Mm. Uh, fun of Terry, I would have, if I was guessing inside your head, I would have said it would be more closely aligned with the German bands of the time. Kraftwerk, yeah. And Norway, Ooh, and yeah, yeah. Faust, Ooh, and yes. whatever that would have been. No, we like Kraftwerk, yeah. mm. uh, but we like dance music, so we were more, like New Order was probably our favorite band. But the, those bands can, Noi, that you can't dance to them. That's like tangerine dreaming. And we didn't smoke weed on. <laughs> but I, there, was, there were definitely that, but the, the, the craft work look yeah. and the craft work stage presence. But I think you said it was. The whole man machine a, a, thing. Yeah. People dreaming of a tech future, not actually being it. Yeah. But it was, a very, it was a very good idea. You know, it it uh, filled us up, I think, the, the craft work thing. And then. In terms of the suits, because I'm, I'm interested in the suits, there, 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 there's also that strand of mod revival, which was very much about the sharpness, working class discipline, um, and seeing off the hippies. Mm. You know, and seeing off hippies meant having sharp suits and not having long hair. It was fundamental to it. But you were, you, the four of you were really quite bourgeois, weren't you? No. Ish. Ish. I come from, uh, well, my father was a professor and my mother a social worker. Yeah. And the, uh, And so, <laughs> and? <laughs> well, uh, we're like middle class. Yes, well. But oddly. Yes. We had a house in Pimlico, which today, to own that house, you would have to run a hedge fund or something. Yeah. And that was just normal. And yeah. then the others, actually, Tim, who's departed us, his parents were university lecturers. 
Uh, Daniel's father was a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> and so? And off we go. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> It doesn't make you a bad person, but I, 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 in the interests of clarity, I think it was a bit. Boring. Not entirely, and then Paul, who came from up north, was what you might. Call oh well, oh well, he might be called yeah. working class. Yes, <laughs> yeah, that, that, but on the whole, we were state yeah. educated. Yes, I did go to an independent school, but I got fired, so I had to go to, back to state school. Pimlico, it's a very curious place, Pimlico. Yeah, fascinating school. Um, I think it's, and the, re, the reason that Pimlico is a curious place, I learned, because it, um, I'm not native to it, um, that nobody actually goes there unless they have to. Hmm. By which I mean, literally, if you if we go there, if you live there, you're going to do something there, but you don't go through it, and you don't visit it, and so it's cut off, and it is physically cut off, on three or four sides. The only way you can actually get into Pimlico is one of about two or three tributary roads on the Vauxhall Bridge Road. So nobody knows it's there, and they think it's an Ealing comedy, mm -hmm. which was actually shot in Kennington, <laughs> you know, because it's all you know, lovely old cockneys and stuff. And Pimlico isn't at all like that. It is pe it's people who go quietly mad, isn't it? You know, well, when I grew up, it Pim was uh, Italian and Irish. But you can walk from Pimlico to here. It's, it's SW1. Yeah, it's very, it's very, very central. And it hasn't changed since but I was of a all kid. But of all central, central places, the least actually known people, yeah. because people think it's a, uh, think it's um, people think it's uh, the other side of the river. Uh, the other side of the oh, river. That's terrible. Well, it, that's because <laughs> of the film, because um. it was filmed in Kennington, right. and the architecture, which is the principal thing about it, because it's cubic, um, and it's made to the same plans as Belgravia, because yeah. cubic just you know, updated by about 20 years, slightly changed the fenestration or the uh, plaster work on ceilings, and made the same houses 20 years later, so that where I live is loosely modeled after Eaton Place. Somewhat less expensive. <laughs> More, please. Do you think the message of the reorganization today is still current in terms of, I mean, I'm, because I'm sitting uh, quite close to that, <laughs> you know, now shall play or <laughs> after yesterday, quite some time. It's lovely, isn't it? <laughs> um, no, I'm thinking, you know, that, um, uh, I mean, uh, the elements they made Britain at the time, um, different from today. I mean, what do you think? Um, you know, uh, yeah. There are things that are still current, you know, and, uh, you know, a blue splash of paint, you know, a great paint to get to somewhere, <laughs> not far would be suitable. <laughs> yeah, because the, <laughs> the motivation wasn't money. Yeah, that's, uh, the, that's the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah, today. Uh, I'm thinking with this uh, social media, the yeah, yeah. news, uh, uh, this uh, conservatorism, uh, uh, you know, uh, and excessive, I mean, because of the elite, I mean, with all the episodes of the scandals we've seen lately, and this is an element of continuity. I think everything's more contrived now. I'm not sure you could have something like that. Well, if you did it today, you'd have a t shirt yeah. installed at the end of the street. And it'd be on Instagram, which yeah. is owned by Facebook, which is controlled by you know, a massive company. It's but I do believe stuff does happen outside the mainstream, just not mm. aware of it. I think but it's great art, it really looks good, very strong aesthetic sensibility, lots of social value, thought, lots of really good things. In your meticulous planning, did you plan to be exclude yourself from the art world critical process decade after decade after decade <laughs> they really punished you didn't they yeah that was a consequence and um yeah we and didn't what, when you say you meticulously planned it did you think no no we had no idea in fact we didn't even oddly we really planned the action itself but we didn't really think what the consequences might be. And actually, we were very surprised to get arrested, which is odd, because we publicised the fact we did it.
but we were kind of shocked that this <laughs> and um, and go, you know, if it had gone on or something, then but you didn't, uh, you hadn't done your name uh, <laughs> the street. No, obviously we had no idea who inhabited the street. Um, not that that would have stopped us, but yeah. but are they by any chance related? Are you saying that the the hostility of the establishment critical system against you was related to the security services. Well, I think they. The that would be a turn up, wouldn't yeah. it? I think the establishment was a thing then, and it embraced all aspects of our culture, yeah. including the arts. So a lot of polite people were saying in polite and quiet places, best not. Probably. Yeah. Best not. Toby Mott, you man, best not. <laughs> Send them away. Mm. <laughs> Export mm. them. Yes. Well, you put up for white. <laughs> Just so he has. <laughs> but um, are we saying that's the way the Brits do it? You yeah. Don't, don't, uh, don't bother killing them. <laughs> Just um, exclude them. Yeah. And that's what happened. Definitely, and I think people like Genesis Peoridge would say the same about himself and if he was here and many others. I think, yeah. Yeah. I think the pistols, are, oh, well, they were, oddly, they would be instantly dropped, as you know, you know. So yeah, for causing trouble, making noise. It's very difficult to tell um, because of the way um, Malcolm staged things, you know, uh, uh, when he died, you really were thinking, what did he mean by that sort of thing with a person like Malcolm? Because he was always creating, creating situations. So sometimes you didn't really know um, uh, whether people were really being excluded or whether that was just their brand. Yeah, part of the story became repeated. Part but in, in your case, you're a victim. Yes. You're a victim. We never saw ourselves as victims. No, but you, you <laughs> could reasonably now claim victimhood. No, because we reinvented ourselves and other opportunities yeah. presented themselves. And you did all right. Yeah. But it could, I'm just saying, at the time, for lesser spirits, it could have been a bit tricky. It, you know, all that. Yeah. Um, but we didn't come from that. We, you know. That wasn't where we... There was that in Soho, people staring into their pint glasses. They were yep. in the colony room. <laughs> they were drinking in the afternoon. Yeah. We were making art. Yep. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a great achievement. And what I want is to have a sort of continuous access to the, the archive. And, I, and there should be a way that you... I mean some of you can think of ways to do this, so that without uh, jeopardizing in any ways any of Toby's income stream, <laughs> which we obviously would not wish to do, but we could have more access. Everything you talk about, I think, I want to see that. I, I never saw that. I want to know about that. And then what did you do? And so on. So you could make it more accessible, like, I don't know. I, I think an institution. Like player. An in, well, it is on YouTube and stuff, but an institution like the Tate or the yeah. V&A Library, and British Library, it's up to them, really. Yes. But, I mean, in the meanwhile, <laughs> we have to congratulate Mr. Mayor and um, this great institution for giving us a, an, early, an early dose, <laughs> um, in an, so to speak. <laughs> Uh, in such a, uh, such a splendid place. Half a lager. Half a lager, <laughs> yes. Um, uh, so, unless anyone's absolutely burning uh, to come out with a question or an observation. Um, I'd like to say something, but I'm just absorbing it all, and then I go home and think about it, and think about you, then and you'll write research it. you, and find out more. <laughs> Just it is very compelling, isn't it? It is. It's very, very compelling. Um, and we all want more. Obviously, everyone wants more of you. Uh, 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 so it's got to be arranged on the national head <laughs> or, or something like that. Anyway, um, th 
thank you. So thank you. And thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, for, uh, for doing public good.